Tim McClanahan. Uh, he'll be talking about evidence for a diurnal cycling of surface hydrogen hydration towards the moon's mid-latitudes using LRO's lend neutron observations. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizing committee for um, allowing me the opportunity to speak today. And I uh, also want to acknowledge my colleagues on the LEND team uh, who uh, made the trip here to uh, California with us. And uh, also I want to acknowledge um, John Pierre Williams, who provided a lot of the diviner modeling uh, work that was done that we're going to be reviewing in a couple of minutes, as well as Ann Parsons, who uh, helped out quite a bit as well. Uh, and she's a Goddard. And uh, what I'm going to be going through is evidence that I presented at LPSC as a start uh, that made the case for a diurnal hydration of the lunar surface in the upper latitudes above about 75 degrees. From there, I'm going to take the same analysis techniques, and we're going to push those into the mid-latitudes. And what we're going to be uh, looking at is, one, we're going to see a gradual transition. And what we'll see as we move more towards the mid-latitudes is that we'll also make the case that it appears, especially in the Mari, that a regular temperature effect is uh, proposed by uh, Luis Teodoro may also be uh, going on uh, in driving this diurnal modulation that we're going to be studying. The, um, so this is what got this debate of uh, regular temperature and uh, diurnal hydration going. This was uh, rigid, it's about two years old, this, uh, this ongoing debate. Uh, it was originally uh, identified by Tim Livinga in 2015. And what he showed in, in his uh, paper was that here's a... Uh, Here's the, uh, starting at midnight, uh, he made the case that this modulating ne uh, neutron flux that he identified in an equatorial study uh, was accumulating towards, uh, towards dawn, dawn is right here, maximum concentrations that reflected in the suppression of the neutron flux, which then, uh, during the course of the day, these uh, arrived, this uh, hydrogen concentrations were mobilized uh, by regular temperature and lost to the surface where you had minimum uh, concentrations in about 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, then the flux recovered uh, over the course of the evening hours, thus completing the diurnal cycle. Uh, this was consistent with uh, the dawn uh, near-infrared detections with uh, Sunshine, Peters, and Clark that were described, uh, especially with uh, the Clark uh, description of the dawn uh, effects. In a subsequent study of lunar prospector uh, data, uh, Luis Teodoro came to the conclusion that using uh, corrected uh, LPNS observations that this was actually a regular temperature effect in uh, influencing modulating the uh, lunar neutrons. And they used uh, neutron transport modeling and uh, diviner subsurface temperature modeling uh, uh, to make the case that regular temperature was cooling in the evening hours, uh, and they had a very similar plot as this after the corrections. Uh, cooling in the, in the uh, evening hours um, uh, such that the uh, flux that generates the, the uh, produces the neutrons, that volume uh, is cooled, the uh, flux is then uh, diminished in the morning hours and then enhanced as the regular uh, heated up. So what we're going to do is you can't really uh, do much with these plots to try to discriminate these two possibilities. Uh, so we're going to fold topography into this analysis in the context of equator facing and forward facing slopes. And we're going to make the case that both of those processes exist. Um, so uh, we can decompose our maps in uh, a couple of different ways. And what we're going to show here is that uh, we, we have a very limited correlation. It's only on the poleward facing side uh, to temperature. And we can render our, our maps, um, and this is above about 75 degrees, as a function of uh, poleward to equator facing slope. That's a continuum and also slope uh, degree. And we have roughly equal um, uh, contrast in low slope conditions, and that contrast hardens as we go up slope, uh, minimum temperatures are in poleward facing conditions, uh, maximum on the right. And as we, uh, we know, we have uh, very similar effects for both the north and the south. Now we decompose the topography, same decomposition of the topography, the lend data sets as well. And we only found a correlation, a positive correlation to temperature on this side. Uh, and uh, we haven't reviewed this, this is the first time this is being presented, uh, and that's in the north. Uh, positive correlations of 0.69 and 0.78. But if you break these in half, we also have a temperature distribution in working in this, uh, in this region from lower left to upper, upper right. And the correlation here is almost non-existent. We have no positive correlation uh, with temperature here. Um, we have this similar effect here and nothing above about 3 degrees. And this band that is below is likely an enhancement of the flux due to these large craters, Rostrosvensky, Plaskett, Hermite, that have very broad uh, crater basins that are flat. And uh, this enhances the galactic uh, cosmic ray influx. 
and also the neutron leakage flux. So we think that uh, uh, this is likely due to uh, those surface effects. Uh, but again, no real correlation to topography. So for half the topography above 75 degrees latitude, we have no positive correlation to, uh, to temperature. And also, I wanted to add that uh, based on this discrepancy, we also um, uh, published this and made the case that hydrogen was biased towards uh, the poleward facing slopes. So now we're going to shift into diurnal mode, and we're going to uh, recast the data, and we're going to take our data in six-hour local time windows, make 24 maps, and systematically slide our local time window in, in one-hour uh, steps and so that we can uh, simulate the, uh, the temperature effects through the course of the lunar day. Equator facing is now below. Poleward facing is right. We start at midnight moving through morning hours. And what we're looking for is this broadening red, and this is on log scale. And we want, and we want to understand this, this, uh, the power of the, of the temperature at the surface as it's induced into the surface to compare it against what we see at the, um, on the equator facing slopes. And then the return, uh, we complete the diurnal cycle here. So what we're going to do is we're going to extract these poleward facing and equator facing profiles, and we're going to calculate the power using a simple Fourier transform, and we're going to monitor, uh, take the amplitude of that, which is the 24-hour wavelength, and square it. And we're going to then track that down into the mid-latitudes and see how that, uh, how that power varies as a function of latitude. Um, I also note that the, uh, the north results that we have are equivalent, so there's no re reason to go through those at this point. Uh, they're very similar. Um, so now we look at the lens CSET and data set, and what we're looking for, one, we, we noted midnight, there's very little difference between equator facing and poleward facing conditions. And this broadening blue, uh, we suggest, is due to a local hydration effect in the, uh, near the morning terminator, uh, dawn terminator, and then that flux starts to rise. And what we're also interested in is where is that power, that four times power that we see that should be in this equator-facing surface? And instead what we see is this kind of diffuse increase in all of the uh, 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 slope aspects. And what we're going to do is we're going to, again, extract these. Um, and you can compare the variability in comparing, like, um, block 4 and block 19. They have a very significant uh, uh, suppression effect um, and modulation effect in comparing equator-facing and poleward-facing conditions. But again, no real driver here on this equator-facing side. And this is opposite what we would expect from regular temperature. We can compare the uh, uh, variability of these two surfaces, and they are significantly different. And the north looks also, again, uh, very similar. So here's just an extraction of the, of, the, of the profiles. And I'll give you the sense of what we mean by the power. Here's the equator-facing surface. And then we're systematically selecting profiles as a function of uh, of uh, slope aspect, and we go to uh, poleward facing uh, traces are here, equator facing are here, and what we're after is this amplitude, and we're going to be squaring that, and we can relate uh, the amplitude of these effects um, in equator facing and poleward facing, and we note that uh, at near dawn, in both cases, uh, we have about 12 parts per million, it seems to be realized between 9 and 7 a.m., um, and uh, similar for both north and south. Um, and we also have this systematic change in the local minima, uh, which uh, starts here for the equator facing, and it seems to walk in this direction uh, towards later in the morning time frame. The, um, again, we have about 12 parts per million are, and, uh, and reflected from the dawn terminator uh, as the baseline for that, and that tells you how much hydrogen we think is being cycled uh, in that result. So here's where we take in our, um, our power analysis, and we're going to project it down into the lower latitudes. Uh, here's the results that we just uh, looked at here, and so we'll consider the south first. And if we start over here, uh, we have this systematic decrease that seems to suggest decreasing temperatures or modulating the flux as we go down. And the equator-facing uh, result has actually got greater power in this uh, latitude uh, range uh, than the poleward-facing. This suggests to us that you may be in a domain where regular temperature appears to be modulating the neutron flux. However, once we get to about 63 degrees latitude, we have an inversion that starts to take place. And then the power begins to grow again for the poleward facing. And this is exactly opposite what we would expect if regular temperature is driving this flux independently. And, we don't, and so we have this opposing effect that doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to jive with what we might expect from regular temperature. 
If we consider the MARE uh, in the, the north result over here, we have a significant response. It's about two to three times what we would expect. And uh, the equator facing is greater. And uh, a review of the plots that we get there uh, suggests that regolith temperature is one of the uh, important contributions uh, to the modulation that is being seen at the equator. Um, as again, though, however, once we get out of the MARE, which is over here, right at around 61 degrees, we have this inversion that takes place, and the power on the poleward facing trace begins to increase, and the equator facing trace continues to decline, uh, suggesting that it is also related more to regolith temperature. So, just to conclude, we have um, in the upper latitudes uh, the three. Uh, Lines of observation, Len, Lola, and Diviner, suggest hydrogen is being uh, diurnally cycled at the surface. Uh, we have no evidence for any regular temperature effect in this upper latitude band. Uh, and we did that, uh, we separated that by just looking at the half of the topography that's more specific towards equator facing slopes. Uh, another line of evidence is that the power in the poleward facing slopes is greater than the equator facing slopes in this uh, latitude. Um, F tests and comparing those, uh, that modulation uh, suggested that it is significant about the 0.01 percent level or 0.01 level. Uh, we uh, suggest the amount of hydrogen is about 0.012 uh, weight percent water equivalent hydrogen or about 12 parts per million. Seems to be a maximized at dawn towards polar depression slopes between about 7 and 9 a.m. Uh, this is very consistent with this hydrogen pumping scenario that was described by uh, Shorthofer and uh, Harrison, uh, the, both the uh, temperature domains and the latitude trends that they exhibited in their paper, as well as the hydrogen concentrations appear to be very consistent with uh, what was described in that paper. The, um, the other interesting thing is that the, in the upper latitudes above about 63 degrees, we have this unexplained increase in the poleward facing slope power. Uh, this is opposite, again, what we expected from a regolith temperature-driven modulation of the neutron flux. This, uh, again, suggests diurnally cycled hydrogen may be increasing as you move from about 63 degrees to the pole. In the mid-latitudes, we seem to have an important contribution from regolith temperature. The, um, this appears to be a, a dominant contribution, especially in the MARE. Uh, this may have some impact to Tim Livingood's paper. Uh, in which um, uh, if the regular temperature, then we need to understand what the exact mixing ratios are of temperature and uh, cycled hydration. So these are going to be important things for us to consider to, uh, consider to study uh, moving, in the next, uh, moving into the future. Um, it's also very possible that we're detecting this in fast neutrons. Uh, if so, it would reflect a, a shallow depth, uh, source depth, in which hydrogen is, going to, is being mobilized. Uh, so this is an important thing for us to consider as well. There is an alternative hypothesis, and we can't completely exclude regolith temperature as, a, as the sole driver. And that is if the geochemistry uh, density, regolith conductivity between poleward and equator-facing slopes is different. If you, for instance, have interstitial water and you're comparing regolith uh, mixtures that have water in the poleward-facing uh, condition, and, it, and it's dry regolith in the equator facing condition, the thermal conductivity properties uh, may, may cause very different uh, uh, thermal waves to be propagated into the regolith. So it may be we, we just cannot um, compare these directly as we have, and we may need to account for subsurface regolith uh, compositional uh, issues that uh, would make the thermal waves different and, uh, and may make uh, uh, regolith temperature an important a more important contribution. Uh, in the future, we're going to be studying the mid-latitudes. Uh, certainly, we're going to be decomposing the highlands and the mare. And uh, we're also going to be uh, working with uh, Jean-Pierre Williams at UCLA in his uh, subsurface uh, modeling and try to account for some, uh, see if we can better quantify this issue of uh, regular temperature. So that's it. I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one question. Okay, uh, Tim, that was an interesting talk. It's interesting to see this evolution in your ideas and results here. Uh, I just want to point out that even with, uh, at the higher latitudes with 0.012 weight percent, um, if that were available to, if that's available to the exosphere, which it has to be if it's actually being cycled and moved around, 
That corresponds to something like 10 to the seventh molecules per cubic centimeter. And uh, certainly, I don't think there's any evidence for that. And at lower, just let me finish a second here, but at lower latitudes as well, the constraints are very severe. And you're talking about at least three, possibly four orders of magnitude lower uh, concentrations than that at, at reasonable altitudes, like 50 kilometers or so. So that puts, that says that whatever's mobile at mid and low latitudes has to be three orders of magnitude at least smaller than that. And I don't think you could see that with the instrument. 